and I'm a Jew, and 50 years ago, my feet on this ground was a death sentence. He gave us food, he gave us protection, and he gave us hope. Oskar Schindler was an angel in the human body. was not afraid of them. He says, now you are with me. Don't be afraid anymore. I always... Well, what first attracted me to the Schindler story was simply that it was a story of the Shoah, and it was a way in to a overview of the Holocaust, which had been something that even though I, I'm not the son of a survivor, I'm certainly related to survivors and victims of the Holocaust through my grandparents with all the relatives they lost. I was always testing myself throughout my life between uh, my shame about being Jewish because I was being raised in Gentile neighborhoods, going to Gentile schools, and I was the, the, the object of a lot of discrimination because I was only Jew in Scottsdale, Arizona, or so it seemed. People remember, the people are still alive, at least the crack of people. They will see that this is a true story, that there's not a make-up story in some studio in Hungary or Yugoslavia. This is made on, in actual places in the ghetto here, on the hills of Kshemionki here. You see, this, this is the importance, because this is a real story, and the people are alive. Krakow, in the period of 41, 42, 43, was sort of like Havana before Castro. It was an open city full of prostitutes, and um, full of gambling, and full of and and, 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 and and ripe with black marketeering, it was it was it was a party town. Smile. Schindler was a party animal. Schindler was the Great Gatsby in many ways. Um, Schindler cultivated friends in high positions in the SS, who uh, uh, were in charge of armaments contracts and 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 contracts to supply the Wehrmacht. And Schindler played Krakow. And, and played Orenburg and played Berlin the way agents play Hollywood. You know, he, he manipulated all the different factions and brought them all together to serve him. He was in the Oscar Schindler business after all. And it's very important to remember that because Schindler knew exactly what he was doing at the beginning of the war. I truly believe at the beginning of the war he was only interested in one person, himself, which makes him a very interesting character to, make a, to, to, to tell a story about because what, what a change he made in his life. Uh, so the beginning of his career was kind of the beginning of my career, where I was just uh, here in Hollywood uh, 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 trying to get people to hire me to direct. Schindler was in Krakow trying to get, uh, uh, trying to get uh, someone to give him some, some sort of business that he could uh, parlay into uh, a, a, a tremendous uh, concern. Uh, Schindler was a tremendous manipulator of people, and because women loved him so much, he would romance seven, eight women at the same time, then he would give six of them away to, to the men who could do him the most good. So in that sense, Schindler was also a pimp. Um, he, was, he, he, he was able to get Jewish investors through Abraham Bankier and Itzhak Stern. He met investors that, while the ghetto was still ripe with Jewish culture, and there was still some clout with the Jewish investors, he was able to get enough money to, to purchase uh, the factory. Jews, yeah, investors. You must have contacts in the Jewish business community working here. What community? Jews can no longer own businesses. That's why this one's in receivership. Ah, but they wouldn't own it. I own it. I pay them back in product, pots and pans. Pots and pans. Something they can use. Something they can feel on their hands. They can trade it on the black market. Do whatever they want. Everybody's happy. If you want, you could run the company for me. Let me understand. They put up all the money, I do all the work. What if you don't mind my asking what you do? I'd make sure it's known the company's in business. I'd see that it had a certain panache. That's what I'm good at, not the work, not the work. The presentation. The character of Oscar Schindler being German and a Nazi and 
a war profiteer and a womanizer and all these interesting inconsistencies and paradoxes and and uh, um, uh, the, the least likely candidate to save anyone except himself perhaps we're doing well yes better this month than last yes any reason to think next month will be worse the war could end in 1943 the the, the nazis decided to stop the ghettos to bring the ghettos to a to a, to a halt and to select a workforce from the Jews in the ghetto, tens of thousands of them. Um, those who could work would be, would be take their blouse shines, their work permits, and um, have their blouse shines torn up because they would be put in forced labor camps such as the one that Amon Get ran at Poshoff. Um, others would be uh, selected and sent away to transport. Transport meaning they would be sent away to Treblinka, Gross Rosen, Auschwitz, Birkenau and they would just go to death. Um, children, old people. But there would be a workforce selected and the workforce would be sent to forced labor camps. Now, Commandant! I respect the report. I've been given orders to clear the bundles from the road so there will be no obstructions to the thoroughfare. Enjoying the lines, little Polish clicking soldier. Amager was an Obersturmführer. He was he was he was a commander of the of the, of the garrison of Sunder Commandos who would come into the Krakow ghetto. His um, reward was that he would be made commandant of the Pasha forced labor camp. I go to work the other day. Everybody's gone. They're not gone. They're here. I don't know how to talk about Amon Get because on the surface he's an evil man and he is he is uh, evil personified he's he's the devil just now when I saw uh, the gentleman playing uh, Amon Get I froze inside even so many years after the war because we never knew what to expect shooting beating uh, deportation whatever when I cast a movie and I cast the movie well, people say to me, that was good casting. Well, obviously, the architects of The Final Solution cast very well the men and women who were in charge of The Final Solution. Um, otherwise, these people might have been in jail in a normal time in Germany. Um, um, they would be in jail for murder. They'd be psychopathic. Every day, workers at Poshov expected would be their last day. Life was like a disposable napkin. You never knew when your time would come. It was just every day was, 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 was surviving. When you came to the end of the day and you saw the sun rise, it was, it was one hour of life is still life, as the, as the Jewish saying goes. The uh, Amon Get would often, in the morning, go to his balcony with his high-powered hunting rifle and smoking, he would look around to see who wasn't working hard enough. And he was a crack shot, and he would aim his rifle, and he would destroy the life of someone who he felt was malingering, or even taking a break and panting and out of breath. And he did this constantly. You know, uh, No one knows how many lives Amon Get actually took himself, but um, uh, people think it was certainly over, uh, over several hundred. This is Mr. and Mrs. Pantera, Mr. Abe Zuckerman, Mr. and Mrs. Broder. They were on Schindler's List. We're children of the Pantera's. I'm Betty Schwartz, my brother Larry Pantera, my sister Elise the Pines. This is Mr. Zuckerman's daughter, Ruth Katz, on the end. This is my daughter, Julie Schwartz, and my sister's son, Justin Pines. There's more, and we're living proof of what Oscar Schindler did for the Jewish people. The Jews didn't cost anything. You paid the SS for the Jews, which was about two marks a day less than you paid for Poles who worked directly for you, and you paid them directly. Um, Schindler being a good businessman, and I don't think wearing his heart on his sleeve so early in his life, uh, made a good business decision to, to save overhead by hiring a workforce that wasn't so expensive. I asked Oscar, tell me, why did you do that? He said, I was a Nazi, but I couldn't stand the killer. Well, Schindler protected his Jews by protecting himself first. He, he fed his Jews more calories a day than other Jews were, were uh, experiencing in other factories. Um, Schindler wanted a healthy workforce. Schindler, I think, was also a good man.
bottom line, I think he was a good person. I think because he was a good person, he treated his Jews well uh, because he was grateful to them, because they were making for him a lot of money, and also because they were people. And he looked upon them as people. He never went in for the untermensch philosophy, subhuman theory that was coming down from Orenburg in Berlin. He looked upon these people as a necessary workforce. And as he was getting fat off their efforts, uh, they were being well fed. And uh, Schindler would do little acts of kindness. He would walk through the ranks of the factory workers, feeling very proud this was his factory and these were his people. And he'd be smoking a cigarette, he'd take two puffs off a fresh cigarette, and he'd drop it and not step on it, knowing that a Jewish worker could pick it up and trade it for more soup or more bread. Um, uh, this was just part of his nature. He was born with this. You know, he, he, he wasn't a saint at birth. He was, he, was, he was actually the opposite. But he was born with an act of decency, and he had a perspective between good and evil. In 1944, the extermination process increased because Germany knew it was losing the war. And Hitler's main goal at this point was to win the war of annihilation of the Jewish culture, the Jewish race, the Jewish idea. Oskar Schindler realized that all his workers were being taken away from him and they were going to be sent to a number of death camps, most, most likely Auschwitz-Birkenau, which is only 40 kilometers away from downtown Krakow. Um, Oskar Schindler put together a list of workers' names, men and women and children and investors from his factory and from other factories in the Poshroff Forest Labor Camp District. And uh, he bought these names with money that he had earned based on the labors of those Jewish workers and gave that money to Amin Get because Amin Get had to approve the workers that Schindler was taking with him on the pretense that he was going to build a factory in Brindlitz, Czechoslovakia, his hometown, by the way, and take all his workers there because they were already a trained workforce. He didn't want to start from scratch creating a new workforce. That was the cover story he gave to Amin Get. Uh, Schindler was very smart never to be caught and never to be thought of as someone who loved Jews. Uh, he convinced the world that he loved money and women and alcohol. All this. A real key to the movie was the relationship between Oscar Schindler and Itzhak Stern. Itzhak Stern is actually a combination of a couple of characters, most notably Abraham Bankier. The key is that Itzhak Stern was kind of like Oscar Schindler's um, conscience. Uh, Stern had a very clever way of making suggestions to Schindler that would, in its own right, save Jewish lives. Oscar Schindler was a wonderful executive producer to compare it with our industry. And he hired the best people to do the best job. And in a sense, it was Oscar Schindler Presents, Abraham Bankier and Itzhak Stern, who did a lot of the work for Oscar, including he ran his factory, they kept his records, kept his accounts. What are you doing? What? Scratching my head. Makes them think we have lice. Helps make them keep their distance. Do you have lice? You have your notebook. The calendar on my desk has the birthdays of our SS friends' wives and children. Don't forget to send something. The armament board, the governor general's division of the interior, and chief of police as fees. And make them on the first of each month. As opposed to individual payoffs to our SS contacts, the list is in the lower drawer of my desk. Which first you of month. SS contacts, list, lower drawer of my desk, which you handle as cash contributions to legitimate charities sent, of course, through each official's office. Dealings with our black market contacts listed as suppliers in the legitimate ledger are forget more it. complicated. What do you mean? Forget it. You it can't forget it. You it can't gives forget me a it. headache. Fair director, don't let things fall apart. I work too hard. Certainly all the major uh, uh, elements in, the, in Schindler's list are absolutely true. Um, I had to combine characters. Uh, I, I had to take incidents from one character's life and allow another character who never experienced those incidents to carry those memories. Otherwise, I would have a hundred storylines all going in the same direction and we would never be able to do the movie that way. <clears throat> um, the movie is, is as true as the witnesses testified to Thomas Keneally, which was our main source. When I began to research the sources, I tried very hard to establish two sources before I put the piece of information in the film. Um, if, if two people told me the same thing, like, like a good reporter, that became part of the story. 
Um, there are things that might be apocryphal. No one really knows if Oscar Schindler himself went to Auschwitz-Birkenau to save the women. Everybody knows that Oscar Schindler did save the women from Birkenau. Some people think he sent a hooker to sleep with Hess and give him diamonds, and that's why the women were released. And other people think that Oscar Schindler actually paid a personal visit to Hess uh, in order to convince him to um, let the women go. We were on the list to go to Brennitz directly to his camp. Instead, we wound up after uh, a train ride of a whole night and a whole day in uh, Auschwitz. And we never thought that we ever, ever going to get out of there. Instead, after three weeks, almost the whole group, without one woman, older lady who unfortunately was killed already by that time, we went, we went on our way to Brinitz, and until we arrived and saw Schindler, we still didn't believe that we are there. And he was standing in that courtyard in his factory as we walked in, really uh, the ghosts of women, not women, you know. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm very careful when I, when I compare my experience making Schindler's List with the experience of the, the actual events in history, because all the pain that I suffered and my family went through and my crew and cast went through in reenacting the story is nothing. It is a weekend in Miami Beach compared to one day in the life of any survivor or any one of the six million memories um, on any given day of the Holocaust. And I always have to put that in very, very careful perspective. And I used that feeling because when there were days for me that were so unbearable, I wanted to quit at one o'clock and send everybody back to the hotel. I didn't want to do the movie anymore. The memories were in every location I, I filmed. They were in the walls of the buildings that actually stood in 1939 and behind the walls of the ghetto, which are still there today. And there were ghosts haunting all of us. I mean, we all sensed that uh, we were there for a very important reason, but we also knew that what we were doing was very, very painful. And I, I mean, I, it wasn't a day that went by where I didn't feel sick in here and sad in my heart. Schindler's List is different than anything else I've done, setting aside the, the concept, the idea of what Schindler's List is about. That aside, um, I took an approach of, of a documentarian more than a David Lean approach, which I love quoting and taking in my films, because I wanted the, the experience to be a personal experience and not really seen to the eyes of a camera. I, I, I tried to make the camera as, um, as, as much a part of the storytelling than a character in itself. Most of my movies, the camera is a character. But in this story, in this recreation, which I think is more of a document, a remembrance than an actual motion picture production, I wanted the camera to sort of be invisible. And to do that, I took what I call news camera approach in, in, in filming some of the scenes like the liquidation of the ghetto, the health action at Prashoff. Many, many scenes were handheld and, and not planned. I didn't planned shots, I didn't sit home at night making shot lists or doing storyboards as I usually do. I just created the, 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 the scene with the actors and all the people playing, you know, playing Jews and Poles and, and Germans. And then I would just wander into the scene like I was an eavesdropper with the camera to try to make the existence of the camera very second nature to what was happening in front of the camera. May I tell you something? When I was yesterday, the first time I was living through through the ghetto liquidation again, I saw the people, I saw people, a friend of mine, like Dr. Alexandrovich over there, the scene in the hospital, execution of these people over there. I was there, I saw this, I live it through again through it. And I think so, this is a very important aspect of the movie, to show the truth. This happened. Many of the German actors who interviewed for Schindler's List, and I saw many of their interviews on tape, many of them actually, knowing I was watching the tape, or would be watching the tape, apologized uh, for the generation preceding theirs, 
um, um, and talked about their guilt and talked about their feelings and very openly. I was so surprised at how many German actors would actually look at the camera into the video camera and talk to me 6,000 miles away. It was, it was sort of a fascinating experience. When I got there and be I began to, to work on Schindler's List, once those same German actors put on the uniforms of the Waffen-SS, um, um, my attitude changed and I couldn't talk to them. I couldn't, and, and between shots they would be schmoozing with me, trying to ask me questions about E.T. and Raiders of the Lost Star, questions that someone who liked those movies would ask the director. And I didn't really want to make small talk. I, I couldn't get past the uniform, and then my prejudice began to come out, and I began to look at it, and I began to say, my goodness, you know, um, how could I be blaming, you know, the sins of the fathers onto the sons and daughters? Why, why, why do I feel this way? And, I, and yet I, was, I felt anger when I saw the uniform. And I knew there was a German in that uniform. I felt anger. And then one day, an amazing thing, thing happened. Very early in the schedule, thank goodness. We had Passover. And we went to the, to, the, to the hotel forum for the Seder. There was a rabbi there, and a lot of my crew and cast came in. And then in walks all the German actors. And they put on yarmulkes. And they sat next to the Israeli actors. And the Israelis opened up the Haggadahs, the prayer books, and began to show the German actors what Passover is all about. And I, 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 and I cried, and I cried because um, I saw something beautiful that was essentially an entire generation of young German actors that are not culpable and should never be blamed and should never have any fingers pointed at them for something that they weren't around to stop. I don't think there can ever be a film or a book or a television presentation or a documentary that can ever represent the true, pure horror of, of the Shoah. Nothing can ever approximate it or even get close. But if this film can at least give a, a musk from it, a sense of it, and people suddenly look back to say, you know, I can't look forward until I look back at this. When we disappear from this life and we're fading away slowly, we're getting old, at least the pictures will stay as a proof that something like this, that the inhumanity meant to man was something that never happened before. And I hope that people will learn something from the movie and will not happen again. You should care about this film if you care about people, if you care about humanity, and if you care about uh, the Holocaust ever happening again and in a way, in, in, a micro, in a microcosm, it's happening right now in Bosnia. And it, it, it happens periodically uh, with uh, the Iraqis against the Kurds. And we see this happening in our own lives right now. And, and we see that neo-Nazism today, you know, is attractive to certain people. And there's been a rising surge of violence from neo-Nazi groups w with the reunification of Germany. And I think there's a lot of reasons that we could never you know, forget the Holocaust. You go to some movies to be entertained, and you go to all my movies to be entertained, but with this movie, you go to this movie to be informed, and I think to be changed, I hope. Well, at the end of the war before Schindler left, Brynlitz left Czechoslovakia, he was given a ring made from the gold in the teeth of one of his own workers. And uh, a jeweler inscribed on this ring in, in Hebrew from the Talmud, he who saves one life saves the world entire. And it is really why people should see Schindler's List, because you don't have to be Wallenberg, you don't have to be Oscar Schindler, you don't have to be a saint to save the world. You know, to save a life creates so many countless generations and that was the message I wanted people to hear that generations were saved by Oscar Schindler uh, 1300 people spawned 6,000 descendants compared to the 4,000 descendants that are alive in Poland today down from 3 million Jews before 1939